Hi everyone, just wanted to start off by saying really big thank you to those people that watched and liked and shared my video last week. It meant that the first vlog got off to a really fantastic start. Before I begin my discussion and my review of this week's book, I wanted to start off by giving you an explanation of this challenge that I've set myself of reading 31 books in my 31st year. If you've watched other book reviews or vlogs on YouTube, then you'll know that a lot of them are focused on books that have just been released or books that have been released this year. Now, some of the books that I will be looking at will be new books or books that have been released this year. But the point is, is that I'm trying to get a really wide variety of reading. So I've asked a lot of different people for the names of their favourite books. And the idea of this is about breadth. It's about me getting a really wide overview of what it is that makes books enjoyable for different people. And so I've not just necessarily asked people with similar tastes to me. I've asked friends, I've asked um, my family, I've asked friends of the family, I've asked students. And so hopefully I've got, um, you know, a really, really wide range of reading material, you know, this year, which will mean that not only will it really widen my knowledge of literature, but hopefully it will really help to improve my own creative writing too. So as I said at the end of last week's video, this week I'm going to be looking at Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar. Now for anybody that doesn't know this novel, it is Plath's only novel. Um, she was an American poet who went to Cambridge um, to university here. Uh, funnily enough, she went to the college that Virginia Woolf also went to and she married famous British poet Ted Hughes. Now, unfortunately for Plath, she was plagued by um, mental health issues for her whole life. And this book um, is semi-autobiographical. So although it's based on a character called Esther, if you have any knowledge of Plath's life, then you are aware that it is very much based on her own experiences. And this book details what it is like for this young woman, Esther, to live with significant um, depression. Before I carry on with the rest of this review and discussion, I have to say that unfortunately I can't leave out details from this discussion and review. So if you haven't read the book and you want to and you don't want to have any spoilers, then don't watch any more because I feel that it's necessary to discuss the plot throughout the book to really have a good discussion of the novel. So what will be coming up next will include details, not just from early on in the novel, but actually later as well. So if you don't want to see any of that, turn off now. I would say that this is a novel very much of two halves. Uh, the first half of the novel details um, a scholarship that Esther has received that is allowing her to live in New York with 11 other girls who are all receiving scholarships for one month of their life. And they are working for magazines there and they are living quite um, a plush lifestyle. They're being put up in a hotel, they go to dinners and it all sounds rather exciting. And we get to hear about um, Esther's encounters with her friends and going to parties but the second half of the novel is when she returns home after her scholarship and she finds out that she hasn't been accepted into a particular writing course and although there were hints in in the first half that she wasn't altogether happy this second half of the novel is a really really stark contrast and very very much focuses on Esther's deep deep unhappiness with life and her feeling that she no longer wants to exist now for a lot of people I can imagine that that sort of subject matter um, doesn't sound particularly uplifting and you'd think that it would be incredibly depressing and that was something that I was concerned about considering I followed up We Need to Talk About Kevin with this novel. It was something that I sort of thought, oh gosh, I'm going from one depressing book to another. But actually I didn't find it particularly depressing 
And I would say that actually this novel isn't a traditional novel and there are several reasons for that that I'll go into more detail in. But first of all, I find Plath's writing incredibly straightforward. So there's no kind of sentimentality around it. Second of all, some of her sections of writing are incredibly poetic. So they almost don't feel like um, real life. And despite my knowledge that Plath did unfortunately go on to kill herself when she was only 30, um, the novel actually has a really, really hopeful ending. So those are things that I'm going to look at in more detail now. As I've said, the first really notable element of Plath's novel that has quite a distancing effect for you as a reader is this straightforward nature of her writing. The second half of the novel very, very much focuses on Esther's obsession with suicide and the idea of um, being free from her life. And she talks about this in an incredibly straightforward way. So the first instance of this is on page 131. And I'm just going to read a few excerpts that I'm going to look at in a little bit more detail to kind of illustrate what I mean. So first of all, she says, in reference to somebody else killing themselves. The trouble about jumping was that if you didn't pick the right number of stories, you might still be alive when you hit bottom. I thought seven stories must be a safe distance. So you can see what I mean in terms of this very straightforward use of language. And this idea of something being a safe distance shows that at this moment in, in time, Esther's preference is um, to be free from her life. She finds death the safer option. Now, the second instance is on page 142 and she's talking about slitting her wrists and she says it would take two motions, one wrist, then the other wrist, three motions if you counted changing the razor from hand to hand, then I would step into the tub and lie down. So you can see here that it's completely devoid of any kind of sentimentality or um anxiety and it just goes to show the state of mind that the character's in and I find that quite remarkable that Plath's been able to capture that so perfectly and then lastly I'm just going to look at this idea that she that she talks about when she talks about trying to um, hang herself and she said that morning I had tried to hang myself I'd taken the silk cord of my mother's yellow bathrobe as soon as she left for work and in the amber shade of the bedroom fashioned it into a knot that slipped up and down on itself now this next bit is the bit that I find really interesting she says it took me a long time to do this because I was poor at knots and had no idea how to make a proper one so again the focus isn't so much on the death itself but in the process of the suicide in this very kind of straightforward tone and therefore, it's not something that made me feel sad. It's something that made me feel quite disturbed that I realised that that's the frame of mind that this character is in at that point in time. As I mentioned in the first section of the video, uh, Plath was a poet mainly. This was her only novel. And I think you can very much see um, that in the poetic nature of her writing. So again, I'm going to look at a couple of excerpts here that I think are particularly poetic and really, really very beautiful writing. So this is when um, the character of Esther decides that she's going to take sleeping pills and she finds a sort of crevice in um, the cellar and she manages to lie down there and go to sleep. She's left a note for her mother to say that she's going for a long walk. Now this is actually something that Plath did herself. She took so many sleeping pills that she went missing for three days but then she was found alive. So as she takes the sleeping pills she says cobwebs touched my face with the softness of moths wrapping my black coat round me like my own sweet shadow i unscrewed the bottle of pills and started taking them swiftly between gulps of water one by one at first nothing happened but as i approached the bottom of the bottle red and blue lights began to flash before my eyes the bottle slid from my fingers and i lay down the silence drew off bearing the pebbles and shells and all the tatty wreckage of my life then, at the rim of vision, it gathered itself and in one sweeping tide rushed me to sleep. So this kind of imagery of water is then continued when she comes round again on the next page in chapter 14. She says, I felt the darkness, but nothing else. 
The silence surged back, smoothing itself as black water smooths to its old surface, calm over a dropped stone. A cool wind rushed by. So you've got this kind of very, very poetic nature to her writing. So that stands in quite um, stark contrast to the straightforward nature of her writing. But neither did I... Uh, neither of which I found um, particularly emotive. Um, I found the straightforward nature quite disturbing and I found the poetic nature really, really very beautiful. But I think what they have in common is, as I've said, this this quite dist uh, a bit of a distancing effect for the reader. And it's really interesting that she actually calls this novel The Bell Jar because it's almost as though she is trapped beneath the bell jar. And she talks about when she does have some relief from her, her depression, it's as though the bell jar is being lifted. But I think this distancing effect that she has created for the reader, it's almost as though she is on, in the bell jar and we are on the outside. So although the subject matter of it is, you know, really, really quite upsetting, I didn't find the novel upsetting because of those two things. So as I've said, unfortunately, I'm not leaving any um, spoilers out of this video. Um, and I really wanted to look at the ending of the novel because this novel isn't all doom and gloom. And at the end, after Esther has had some treatment in um, an asylum, she goes to a board of doctors um, to see if she can be released. And the last words of the novel I found particularly hopeful and uplifting. She says, the eyes and the faces all turn themselves towards me and guiding myself by them as by a magical thread, I stepped into the room. And that's how the novel ends. And so we don't know whether Esther is released, um, but what we do know is that her life is moving on as, and that she's ready to move on. Unfortunately for Plath, that wasn't the case. But I think that it is really important to have a message of hope at the end of this novel to show people that depression doesn't mean the end of your life. Um, it is something that you can get past and you can get better and you can have hope in the future. And so therefore, I think it is a really, really important novel um, for people to experience if they don't have a good understanding of mental health problems, um, especially those people that think that depression can just be shrugged off or gotten rid of this just goes to show how debilitating um uh you know the disease can be so overall this was definitely a read i really really enjoyed um i wouldn't say that i found it really compelling i would say that i found it incredibly beautiful and i would say that i think it's a very very important novel for people to read to try and gain a greater understanding of mental health problems. I'd give it a total of four out of five stars. Coming up next week will be my review of 2017's young adult novel Indigo Donut by Patrice Lawrence. If you are enjoying watching these then please do like, share and subscribe.